Over the course of this semester, we're going to learn a lot of facts. You know, you'll learn how to distinguish between a ghetto and a barrio and a favela. You'll learn how to make the distinction between a pidgin language, a creole language, and a lingua franca. You'll learn how to recognize a city that's built on the Latin American city model. There'll be lots and lots of discrete pieces of information that you'll learn. But I'm willing to bet that for all of us, 20 years from now, we'll remember very, very few of those facts. The one, the one big idea that I hope you leave this class with is the idea of the cultural landscape. That's the idea that when you look out at the world and you see things that people have done, you can read those things. You can look at them and interpret them and know something about the people who made them and the values that they must have held. When we talk about the cultural landscape, we're talking about a view of that part of the world that reveals the actions of humans. So when you look at a suburban neighborhood, you're looking at a cultural landscape. When you look at an industrial park, that's a cultural landscape too. So too is a farm, even something like a national park, which many people think of as pure nature, is a cultural landscape. Just think of how the choice of where to put a park road or where to put the scenic overlook signs determines how people experience nature within the park. And all of these cultural landscapes can be read in very much the same way as we might read an article or a book or a website. We look at it, try to understand what it means, try to understand what it tells us about the time in which it was made and the people who made it. So let's look at a couple of houses. Here is a classic middle-class house from the 1920s. It's a bungalow, sometimes called a craftsman bungalow because of the exposed woodwork that shows off the skill of the builder. But the most distinctive feature is the huge porch. It's not just some porch that got nailed onto the front of the house. This porch is an integral part of the design with the roof extending well forward of the living space to cover the porch. It's a building that says that the people who live here like to sit out front in the evening and chat with their neighbors as they walk by. Now what don't you see? There's no visible garage. In a style of building like this, the garage is hidden, either underneath the building or in the backyard. A garage is clearly not an important part of the design and may even be slightly embarrassing, some ugly thing to be hidden out back. Now here is a middle-class house from the 2020s, about a hundred years later. Look at what has changed. The porch has virtually disappeared and the most dramatic architectural feature is the garage. This is not a house for casual evening encounters with neighbors who walk by. That porch faces west and it's murderously hot in the evenings. And in fact, the front door may get very little use as people come and go through the garage. And look at those garages. Far from being something to hide in back, the garage has now become something of which to be proud. Our cultural landscape tells us what's important to the people who made it. Now let's look at a small county park in eastern Kansas. This is Wyandotte County Park, a small park on the outskirts of Kansas City. It was developed in the late 30s and 1940s, beginning as the nation was still in the Great Depression and continuing through the early years of the Second World War. Take a look at this building. It's made of rough stone and heavy wooden beams with big roof overhangs. And it's not just rough stone, it's stone that looks just like the local limestone bedrock in this part of the country. That makes the building look as though it grew right out of the local bedrock. And it looks rustic as though a couple of local folks might have cut down some trees to make the beams and gathered up local rocks and then built the building. It's a style known as National Park Rustic, and it's a bit of a fraud because there is very little about this building that is either local or rustic. It was designed by architects who worked for the United States Department of the Interior, and it was built by a construction company with a big government contract. Now this building could have been built in any kind of style. It could have been made of smooth concrete. 
It could have been made of sparkling steel and glass, which was very much in fashion when this building was built. It could have been made with wooden clapboards painted white to look like a New England church. But it wasn't. It was made to look as though it might be local, maybe even indigenous. Why? Because the people who designed it and paid for it were living in a chaotic world and had a romantic attachment to things local and rustic. Like a lot of parks, this one includes a multi-purpose hall, the kind of building that can be used for educational events or art exhibits or can even be rented out for wedding receptions and things like that. But look at this building closely. First, note that it's built from the same rough limestone blocks, and almost every block is a different size and shape. Now remember, this is a mid-century building. It could have been built to look modern, but it was deliberately designed to look ancient. And look at the way the stone seems to grow right out of the earth. It's another example of National Park rustic architecture. But remember, this isn't a national park. This is a little county park in eastern Kansas. So how come it's using design themes from the national parks? For that, we need to remember a little history. During the Great Depression, the federal government was eager to sponsor building projects throughout the country. They wanted to put unemployed people to work and they wanted to create public structures things like the giant hydropower dams out west that the nation needed. And one of the things the federal government wanted to build was parks. But most parks agencies are in fact state and local agencies. So the federal government gave those agency grants and sometimes gave them actual workers to build state and local parks. But small counties didn't have park designs all drawn up and ready to build. So the National Park Service had a set of design standards that they would provide to local agencies saying basically, hey, use these design ideas and you'll get a good looking park. That's how federal park designs came to be used in this little county park. Now take a closer look at the tower on this building. The first question that might come to mind is why in the world does this building need a tower? It's not a fort, it doesn't need a lookout tower or a place from which to fend off an invading army. In fact, it has no need for a tower at all. It's a decorative flourish. Now look even more closely at the top of the tower. See how rough it is? As though the tower used to be taller, but a bunch of stones fell down, making the tower shorter and rough. But as stones buildings go, this one is young. It's barely 70 years old. It's not falling down. It was built to look as though it is falling down, as though instead of being 70 years old, it might be 700 years old. Now, remember there were no people of European ancestry living here 700 years ago. So when you make a building that looks like it might be several hundred years old, you are creating an illusion that it was built by an indigenous people. There's that same romantic connection to the past, creeping into the design of buildings again. Having driven indigenous people off this land a couple of hundred years ago, the designers of this park want to create a romantic illusion of their presence. What's really interesting is that this same style of tower is found at other parks. Here's a building from Grand Canyon National Park. See the similarity? Note the use of local stone, so the building seems to grow right out of the bedrock. And notice that deceptively falling down tower. Now, if we were to turn away from reading the landscape for a minute and look in the archives, we would find that this building had been designed by Mary Jane Coulter, who worked for the Fred Harvey Company, which was in the business of developing tourist locations for passengers on the Santa Fe Railroad. And this building, which is now part of Grand Canyon National Park, was actually built before the National Park had been created. So it can't be a product of National Park rustic architecture. It predates National Park rustic architecture. 
Same thing for this building, also in what is now Grand Canyon National Park, but which predates the park. Same local stone, same illusion of a falling down top of the tower, also designed by Mary Jane Coulter, also for Fred Harvey and the Santa Fe Railroad. So what is going on? Well, it turns out that when the architects of the Department of the Interior were developing the National Park rustic style, they studied, among other things, the designs that Mary Jane Coulter did for Fred Harvey and the Santa Fe Railroad. It looks as though the illusion of the ancient falling down tower was transplanted from Mary Jane Coulter's work to the U.S. Department of the Interior's design ideas for National Park rustic style. Then those ideas were transplanted to this county park in Kansas when the county won a federal grant to build the park during the Depression. And the values of a respect for localness, of rough-hewn building, of material that looks like it's gathered on site, of the presence of indigenous people were incorporated into these buildings that are viewed, but probably not understood, by the thousands of people who use the park. So if you leave this class with only one idea, let it be the idea that the cultural landscape is something that can be read, that you can look out there and see the things that people made and interpret them and read them just like you read a book or an article or a website and come to have some understanding of the people who made those things and the values they must have held.